Good morning from me as well. My name is uh, Haralamus Kriostomo. I'm currently an associate research scientist at Castor Sim. And today I'm going to talk about, about data cleaning and pre-processing for scientific computing. I believe it is also it's a relatively simple concept in how to apply it, but it's very important if you are going to dealing with uh, real world data uh, that may have some uh, errors, inconsistencies, uh, missing data, outliers, and so on. So, for example, if you are going to build any kind of model based on real world data, there is a saying that garbage in, garbage out. This is regardless how good or complex your model is. So if we, the better data you have, the better models you are going to have. So we are going also to talk about some other perspectives, not only about the quality, but also bias and fairness in, in your data and how to be able to make sure that you ha have bias, uh, to remove bias and have fairness in your data about some aspect that is going to increase the performance and accuracy in your models. And also the final um, the two things is trust and usability of any kind of uh, output you are going to derive of models based on uh, real world data. And, and lastly, uh, efficiency of your analysis. Then, in the talk is going to be split into two parts. The first part is going to be about data cleaning, which is both the process in identifying and also correcting errors in your data set, just uh, dealing with missing or incorrect data. Um, and this process ensures that your data set is going to be accurate, consistent, and usable, uh, which is very, very important. And the second step of this presentation is going to be about data pre-processing which is involved in ensuring it to transform your raw data into an understandable format for algorithms in general, not only deep learning or machine learning models, and, and also prepare your inputs for machine learning models. So the first part about data cleaning, we are going to talk about missing the, the four more important aspects that you need to consider every time you deal with the real world data is about missing values, outliers, duplicates, and inconsistency in your data sets. First of all, handling missing values. How about the, what, what we are talking about missing values, for, this is, it should be the first and most critical step in your data clean. So if you don't, if you don't do with missing values, you are going to have bias and correct results. And in some cases, you are not going to be able to use your data set in, in, in some cases, if you have missing values. And then we're going to discuss three primary strategies that we are going to deal with uh, uh, these missing values. The first one is the dropping uh, missing values, just to remove them. And then if you cannot remove them or you are going to remove a large part of your data set, it's going to talk about imputation techniques and interpolation techniques that is going to try and fill up these gaps in your data set. So the first one is the most simple one, is just dropping missing values. It's going to be the simplest method, and that just you are going to remove either the rows, the some entries, or the columns, some features from your data set. The advantage of using such technique is going to be, it's very, very easy to implement. It's just in dropping your data set. And this it doesn't, because it doesn't alter your data set, it doesn't introduce any additional bias. The disadvantage is, is going to be, especially if you are going to lose information, you are going to drop in, remove information from a data. So, so it can be, uh, it, it remove data and sometimes you are going to remove related data. And then is uh, this also is not ideal when the missingness is not random. You have systematic missingness. So if it's systematic, Dropping all this information is not going to deal with the problem why you have not random missing, but systematic missing. So this the two, uh, when you are going to use this technique, it's going to be when your data set is large enough and only a small portion of your data set is going to be removed. So you have to be aware how much information you are going to remove. And also the missingness of is, is likely not to be random. Uh, if you if the missing is just random, you can use this technique. So the next, if you cannot use um, dropping, uh, removing these um, uh, 
uh, missingness, then you are going to try some imputation techniques. Uh, imputation involves missing, missing, uh, feeling missing values with an estimated one. This method can also vary depending on what type of data you have. So for example, if you have continuous data, so you can try fill up this uh, data set with a mean, media, or mode imputation. Just calculate the mean, media, or mode of that uh, value in your entire data set and try to fill up with that value. So it kind of thing of predictive imputation, uh, which is a little bit more advanced. Uh, uh, oh, for example, you can use mean for continuous variables and median mode for categorical var uh, uh, variables. And then you can go a little bit more on that and use predictive imputation where you can use statistics of machine learning algorithms in order, in order to predict this value, which is the most likely scenario. The advantage is it, it prevents data loss. So we are going, if you are going to uh, fill up this mission, if you are going to uh, use as much as possible as uh, from uh, from your data set, you can uh, it can also handle non-random missingness if it's done correctly. And but the disadvantage is, is it if is this assumption you make for your data set is incorrect, it can introduce bias. So you have to be uh, be a bit careful if the assumptions you make about your data set are correct or are mostly correct. And this is more complex to implement in related to just to remove the missing uh, values. When you are going to use imputation techniques, if the missing name again is not random, and then you have enough information to fill up this uh, information with the reasonable estimates. So, and then the last method about miss, uh, fill up missing information is interpolation, which involves in estimating missing values using other adjacent observer values, not the entire data set, but select specific subset which is very close or adjacent to the to the information you have based on the other feature in your data set. So, and then you can try linear interpolation, which is assumes a straight line, the relationship between points. So you are, uh, you assume that the rest of the points have li li linear interpolation or they have polynomial or spline interpolation, which are assume polynomial non-linear uh, relationship between the points you have and the ones that you are missing. The advantage is, is that you can provide a very good estimate for time series data. If you have time series data, this is a very, very good uh, technique, the interpolation. And also this technique can handle, if we are using polynomial splice interpolation, it can handle nonlinear relationships. The disadvantage is uh, it doesn't work very well if the assumption about the relationship about your sample are incorrect. So you have to make sure, for example, if you are assuming linear uh, relationship, you can apply linear interpolation. But if, you, if the relationship is polynomial, then the results are not going to be very good. You have to make the correct assumption. You have to know a little bit better about your data in order to apply interpolation. And also one this other advantage is not suitable for categorical data. It works very well for um, time series data, but it's not uh, suitable for categorical data. And also when to use it only when you have sequential data like time series. And then the missing values is likely to be related in a function of the nearest. So you have to, if you assume that if you are, you are very close to a nonce, it is not deviate that much. So you can estimate very close to the, to its neighbors. Okay. So you have your data set, then you try to fill up as much as possible in, in your data set. And now you have a more or less complete data set that you're ready to fill up. Uh, to make it start, start some statistical analysis, some uh, machine learning, and so on. The next step you have to take to, into consideration is outliers. Outliers are not that easy to pick up, and uh, most probably will have the, the, the most major impact in your analysis than any other feature. So you have to be very careful on how to handle outliers. Oh, outliers, what do we mean outliers? Outliers is the, any single given data point that significantly deviates or differs from the rest of your data. So it's 
far away. Far away, we, need, we are going to discuss what do we mean far away and how we can estimate that. And then this can significantly, especially if you are dealing with machine learning methodologies, this can have a significant uh, effect in the performance of this kind of model. And usually they lead into incorrect conclusions. And then we are going to discuss three methods on how you can identify this. The first one is the Z-score method, the IQR method, and then Wednesdayization, how you can identify and how you can handle them. The first one is the Z-score method, which you can take the entire data set in each data point, and then you can uh, transform it into by subtracting the mean of your data set and divide by standard deviation. This will shift your entire data set into where you, your mean value is zero, and each value is how much it deviates from the mean. So the, the, the transform, for example, it's this new point where you, each new point, you subtract the mean of your entire data set, divide by standard deviation. And then you are going to have something like this. You have your mean, in, in all your data in the mean, and then you have how much deviation each data point has from, from the mean of the data set. And then you can say that, so for example, you assume, for example, any uh, any point that is beyond two sigma, two standard deviation, is going to be considered an outlier, or three sigma or five sigma. It depends on you, but usually anything between three sigma is going to definitely be considered an outlier. Uh, when you, as you can see from the graph, uh, the first assumption that you need to make is that if you are going to use Z-score, it's uh, your data is uniformly distributed. You have this distribution. It, it, this method goes very well in normally distributed data. And it's also very simple to calculate. The formula I showed before, it's very, very simple to calculate. The disadvantage is, is that if you have, it's, this is also very sensitive to extreme value. Because in the formula I showed before, you subtract between the mean and divide by standard deviation. So if you have extreme uh, outliers, it's going to affect the entire mean of your data set. For example, what do we mean about the extreme outliers is, for example, the entire set is between zero and one, and you have a single value in the range of one million. So a single value will have a significant impact in your in the mean of your entire set. So that's why it is very sensitive to extreme values. That's why I mean extreme values. And also it assumes that you follow a normal distribution. If you, if you don't have this assumption that your data is normally distributed, it will not work that well. Okay. Um, the next method is the IQR method, where you calculate is, is also a statistical and uh, measure the statistical expression of the spread of your data set and indicates the range or within the central 50% of your data lie. So for example, if you seeing this this uh, box plot, I because we don't have time, I will not show the mathematics behind it. But if you see this box plot, how you can read it is that in the box, it, it lies 50% of your data. And then this is the median value. So you know where the majority of your data points lie. And then if you take these limits, the Q1 and Q3, which is enclose the 50% of your data, then you can multiply this by 1.5, and then you define the range of your data set. So you see the, the lowest me, uh, limit where you can have a valid uh, non-outlier uh, threshold, and then you have the out. And, and in this box plot, each uh, value that is considered outlier is going to be individually plotted as a dot. So this is how you read this box plot. So if you if you know if you know how to read it, you can identify the uh, straight away where and what is your outlier. Oh, okay. The advantage is that it's very robust to extreme values. This methodology can identify very easily the extreme values, and also this methodology doesn't assume normal distribution. So you can use it if your distribution is not normally distributed. And this is also the disadvantage: it can be less effective if your outliers, if if you have a lot of outliers in your data set, and also assume that data is not is unimodal. 
when you are going to use this is uh, you can use this methodology when you cannot use the z-score methodology when for example your data is not orally distributed and also you have this uh, problem with extreme uh, outliers the last method is called with uh, with, with zonization which is going to involve for example you sort this range for example this is a um, uh, distribution of patients uh, with values one to uh, uh, to 300 and then you can see the majority if you plot the frequency you can see the majority of the patient is very low one to 10 10 to 20 to 30 so you have the majority of your data in less than 50 you see then so but you have patients that has this value 300 and so on so how you can deal it, you can say, you can plot this and see the frequency of the VR values, the range of the VR values, and then you have to set a manual threshold. So you can consider anything between 100, which is uh, covers uh, about, about 3% of your data set, is going to be considered outlier because it's outside the range. You can see, if you include this, you extend the range three times. Instead of only 3% of your data is spread in two thirds of your range. So it's going to be significantly extended. And then this threshold, the percentile is going to be a random based on, on observation. This is set to maybe 1%. 1% of the are top is going to be considered an outlier. And the advantage is going to reduce and how you can deal it is that you don't remove them, just replace them. So for example, you take these values that is beyond 100 and make them 100. So it's going to re also replace the values and, and uh, reduce the range of the of your data set. And this is the advantage is going to reduce the impact of the extreme values without completely removing them. Then you are keeping the values. And then you don't make any assumption about your data execution. So you, if you don't have any information about how your data is distributed, you can use this method. And, but the disadvantage is because this is a manual threshold, you based on the expert. If it's don't, if you don't put a very suitable threshold, it can also introduce bias in your in your data set. And also, this methodology is one of the few that it, you don't remove the outliers; you just replace the values with non-outlier values. It can you have to be keep in mind that it alters your data. It's uh, it's one of the methods that alters your data, and this is when you are going to use it. It is because uh, when in in cases where you don't want to remove the outliers, you want to keep them, but you want to reduce the effect of these outliers. So that's why you want to use this methodology. Uh, okay, so. We cover how you fill up missing information and how you deal with outliers. The next step in, in what you have to do in, in when you deal with the real world is to how to handle duplicate data in your data set. What do you mean about duplicate? It's identical entries. It's identical entries in, in your data set. And this occurs in real world scenario. It can occur for many results. For example, for data entry errors, uh, if you are going to merge from different sources, sometimes you may do it twice by error. So you are going to introduce multiple uh, identical entries or in, in correct data collection method and so on. Uh, it's not important how it happens, but it happens uh, so often that it's a significant problem in, in in data. And what is the impact of this duplicate data? It is also leads to overrepresentation of certain information so in your data set. So introduce biases and uh, not fairness. And also uh, it also introduced bias in the results of your analysis. And this also has a major effect in the training of the model, also skewed performance measures. So when you uh, evaluate uh, the performance, if you have this duplicate information, it will, uh, the result is not going to be representative on how well a specific model uh, learns, for example. Um, so the 
the easy thing, what you have to do in this is that first you have to identify them and then you have to remove them. Uh, the duplicate data removal is very easy to implement and also improves the accuracy, but the disadvantage is how you identify this duplicate error because it requires, a, you have to be very careful when you remove duplicate entries. You want to remove all the entries where you, you are sure that it's due to error, not due to a duplicate observation. And this is the most important also is because it's not that trivial it seems to separate if it's, for example, you read the, a file twice and then you enter in your database and then you measure that validity twice. So you need to be able to separate these two scenarios. Uh, okay. And then he, instead of uh, not only in duplicate entries, but also in many cases, you have data entry uh, inconsistencies. And then also inconsistency in, in comes from human error, most of the cases, uh, but also comes from different data entry conversions in, in other cases, and also some system glitch. What do we mean by inconsistency in your data? For example, you may end up with this kind of scenarios. So for example, we have case standardization. So for example, you want to encode some classes, some case scenario, and in your data set, you have, for example, apple, um, banana, and cherry, this, and then you have other cases where banana may be only the B capital, and other cases where you have uh, all lower case and so on. So if you are going to encode it based on the unique variable, you, you are going to end up with more classes than necessary. So you need to, before you do any transformation of your data set, you have to standardize. So for example, decide that case standardization, everything needs to be lower key. So transform your data set to lower key, just to make, um, uh, just to avoid the case standardization, just to make sure that everything is standardized in the same thing that, or everything covered, doesn't matter, just to be standardized. The other important thing is formatting date. Date is very important. For example, you can convert this date to, to any other format, but you need to be careful. Also, date is very tricky because, for example, if you collect data from Europe, usually you are going to see this kind of form, uh, this kind of uh, format, for example, 31 December 2020. If you collect data from USA, it's going to be in the reverse. First comes the month, then comes the date, and then the year. If you directly convert them without taking this into consideration, you are going to have to deal later on with major inconsistencies in your data. So you have to be careful. The other thing about time, time is very tricky because you have time zones. Time zones, you have to convert everything as well into the same time zone. So, I mean, you collect something at 12 o'clock, it's 12 o'clock, doesn't matter if it's noon or it's just universally collecting from a global scale, you need to standardize it into a global and uni uniform time zone. For example, these things that you need to take into consideration. Also, the other thing is also merging categories. Sometimes you have many categories that in different case scenarios. So for example, may if you are dealing with cities, you may have New York City or New uh, NYC, District is the same class, so you have to have this uniformity in your class. The other thing that you have to be a little bit careful that is not usually known is that white space. White space is a, a major impact because uh, usually when you manually curate this, you don't see it, but in a, in a computer, for example, if you find John with a space and John without a space, it will be considered different class. So because it doesn't actually read the content of the letter, it just reads the character and compare the character in a string. So John with space and John without space, it may be in your eyes it's going to be identical, but for a computer it's not. And then you have to also be careful about different uh, standards because you are, if you are going to consider using English, for example, your entire data set, you have to consider different uh, cases, for example, in, in words like gray and color, not only users may write gray and color the same way, and both are valid. 
So you need to have this master directory that every time you see different variation of the word gray that is valid, it's going to be converted in the same case. So this is things that you need to take into consideration on this one, and it's going to have an effect in your analysis. So what, and the other thing, consistent data entry correction, it was, it enhances the data uniformity of your data and also improves the accuracy of your analysis. The disadvantage, as you can see, is very time consuming. And then you need to be an expert in your data. You cannot take raw data and use them directly. You need to understand exactly what your data is about. And then when you when you can use it, it there is irregularities in your data representation, and especially if the data set comes from different sources on, on conversion. Okay, this is until now we cover up around data cleaning, how you can clean data. Then we are going to talk about data preprocessing. Data preprocessing usually we talk about data transformation, feature scaling, normalization encoding and encoding all variables and also feature selection. Uh, when you do, when you are talking about data transformation, you take that data involving uh, of, uh, in, a, in, a diff, in a specific scale or distribution, and then you're going to change the scale or distribution in order to represent your data. And then you are going to discuss about diff three different techniques, log, uh, log transformation, box Box Cox transformation and Yer Johnson transformation, and when you can use them. For example, one very important case scenario. For example, this is the um, the metabolomic rate versus body weight of all mammals. If you are going to take the raw recordings of your data, this what you are going to see. What is, but it's not straight obvious. What is the relationship between metabolomic rate and so one very obvious way to visualize it and be able to have a better representation is to do a lot of transformation. For example, if you do a lot of transformation in the scale, this is the new result. You didn't change actually your data, you uh, transform, it in, transform it in a different scale. As you can see directly that uh, metabolomic rate and, and body weight have a linear relationship. It's very obvious, but it's very obvious after you did the transformation, not all very obvious from, from the start. And this is the case for very many, many cases. So uh, for example, when you can use all transformation, it's, it can help you manage your data based on scale, most of the cases, and also compress the scale of the data, make it easy, very easy to handle. Because in the previous case scenario, this year you are going to deal with from zero to 6,000 and from zero to uh, half a million almost. And then as you can see, the majority of your data is very, very close to zero. So the majority of the number is very, this will transform the scale into something much more manageable. And then the, the distribution of your data is uniformly distributed. So this is going to be handled very, very easier in any statistical or machine learning uh, methodology. Uh, the disadvantage is, is this cannot be applied to zero negative values. So you can see log transformation works only with positive numbers. And this also may be um, not normalized the distribution of your data if it's very heavy dispute in one or the other um, side. Uh, use it only when your data is right queued, tail to the right, and all points are positive. What happens with when you don't fill up this requirement? Then you are going to use Box not of Yale Johnson transformation, which is very flexible uh, methodology to transform your data, any kind of data that has a non-normal distribution to non to normal distribution. So for example, you have this histogram of various observation, and then when you transform it using lambda in this case equal to zero, it's going to be transformed this uh, mostly Boisson distribution to normal distribution. So this is much more easily to manage and it can be approximated using a linear relation. So, but when the advantage is, for example, it can dynamically determine the power transformation. And also this works very well about for positive non-zero data, then box code normalization. And if you have a negative and zero, you have to use the Johnson. So it depends if you have 
negative number, you have to only use your Johnson transformation. If you only have positive number, again, you can uh, use um, both box knots and your Johnson transformation. And this is when you can use it is when your data is very is good uh, into one of the two sides. And then it, this is a very dynamic method to normalize your data. Uh, but the important thing is that you have to find a suitable parameter L. So this is the only parameter that you have to parameter L. So you have to find a very suitable parameter. So this is the only limitation of these uh, methods. So for example, this is how you can transform your data. And then you have to scale your data. Scale your data is very important because in, 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 in machine, especially machine learning methodologies, they don't work very well with open-ended uh, ranges. So you have to scale, most importantly, you have to scale your features to have a specific limit, usually between zero and one, minus one to one, and so on. But what is the most appropriate way to do it? And we are going to discuss three methods here, mean max scaling, standard scaling, and robot scaling. What are these? Uh, mean max scaling, it assures that it is the formula. You take your any given data point, you subtract the mean, and then you divide by the difference of maximum and the mean. So this is to ensure that your data is still uh, between zero and one. It's also very simple and intuitive to use. It also preserves the original distribution. Uh, but again, this is also very sensitive to outliers, this methodology. And it's not suitable for uh, data with large standard deviation with a future um, effect of outlier or if it can be not an outlier, but it can be real world observation, but the distribution, you have a few points that are a little bit outside of your mean. Well, you can use it if you, if you want to preserve zero values in your data set. So, and also if you if your data doesn't contain any extreme outliers. If your data contains a lot of outliers, then you can use the original method, the z for normalization, when we use to identify outliers. You can use the same scaling, again, to be able to do statistics and also uh, analyze the, the data. This is the formula. You can use it after the, I mean, after you uh, remove this uh, uh, outliers, maybe due to error, maybe due to different observation, you can use the remaining ones using z-score normalization. And the advantage is because the center of this distribution is always zero or around very close to zero, it can handle outliers better. Not perfect, but better than min-max normalization. Also, the disadvantages because you use the score, you are not having close uh, ranges. So you can again have very close to from center zero, but you can have minus five to five if you have very extreme value. So usually have around minus two to two. And this is also very influenced by extreme outlines. And this is very also useful if your data follows Gaussian distribution and also your accuracy assumed data is center, especially if you are going to use principal component analysis. So this works very well with principal component analysis. The other method you are going to use that again, the method I showed before, which is for um, IQR method to identify outliers, but you can use the same method to normalize the data. This is the formula you identify Q1 and Q3. And then you use it instead of uh, saying uh, as min max, but in this case, instead of using mean and max of your data, you use Q1 and Q3 of your data. That covers 50% of your data set, not all of it, but 50%. The advantage is also, this advantage reduces the effect of outliers. It's very useful for heavy tail distribution, if you like, okay. And also doesn't scale, uh, this advantage doesn't scale very well to specific range but can uh, have a very well, perform very well if your distribution is non-Gaussian. When you are going to use it, if it, the data contains many outliers, and then you want to re reduce the effect of these outliers. I'm going to 
skip. <laughs> uh, I think I have a lot of slides yet, but I'm going to go through them a little bit. Uh, and uh, every machine learning model needs to know numbers. They don't know any, usually they need to transform your data to numbers. And this is a, a problem if you are going to have categorical data, how you encode categorical data. And how you can do it, for example, label encoding, you select any class and then you assign a number, one, two, three, randomly. You don't have a need to have a specific order. And this is also very simple to implement. And also it doesn't increase the dimensionality of your data. Same class, the same number of uh, classes, same number of encodings. But this loses the, the relationship between, so for example, if, if it's important to you, red is one step away from green, but red in this case is two step away from green. Does it make, is, is it important for you to see how far a label is from other? If it, if this is very useful if, it, if the relationship between the, the different classes does not need to be conserved. If it, the other way is that you can use this uh, one code encoding where you can have uh, this red, green, and blue into one single vector, which one zero zero is red, and then follow it. The problem with this one is in significantly increasing dimensionality of your data, because imagine if you have a thousand classes, this table needs to be a thousand uh, uh, length in, in row and code. So it significantly uh, impacts the dimensionality of your data, you can, but you can use this if you have very few classes to, to do because you can also use it because they limit any inside of there. It's very important, but we can significantly increase the dimensionality of your data. And then uh, I was going to skip this one, but I will show the slides anyway, if you want to see. Yeah, and then the, the last one is feature selection where you can filter the most important feature in your data set using any Pearson correlation, high square test, mutual information. This is an example of filter method where you can have, you can assign a score and then only select based the threshold for the most important feature. Uh, this is going to reduce the number of features in your data set and then it eliminate noise in irrelevant features and so on, so in order to improve the efficiency of your um, uh, analysis, but sometimes it removes necessary. So you have to be a little bit careful how you use it. Uh, okay, and then you have some the wrapper methods. The wrapper method is you do forward selection, backward selection. For example, this you use every feature and then you start eliminating, removing one by one, or put start with one and then adding to see how it impacts your methodology. It's different, but this takes a lot of time. You can imagine if you have many features, it takes a, a lot of time to implement, but it's a better way to select the most appropriate feature for your analysis. So, you have to have a balance on how much time and resources you need to devote to the feature selection and how much it really matters in, in your application. Okay, so just before I close, I just, I said it has a significant effect on your data set, but how much? So for example, I'm just, I'm just showing numbers for the last few slides in the slide just to see the impact of just data cleaning and pre-processing in the analysis. So this is uh, the titanium data set. It just collects data from the passengers and see uh, if they survive the trip or not. And then it's going to build a, a, a very simple model and just to predict based on the status, age, gender, and so on, if a passenger survives the journey or not. As you can imagine, this is a very, ah, in the slide, if you, want, if you want to see the code, you can access it from this uh, URL. But, so for example, the objective is you have around 1,300 tyrannic passengers. You have a lot of features, okay. And you, and the problem with this data set, it has all the problems we discussed. You have missing values, you have outliers, you have inconsistencies, you have everything. And then when you apply this 
directly. So, for example, you drop some uh, data set that you either are related or you have a lot of this information and you cannot use them. So, for example, if you do some logistic regression, the accuracy is around this 65% the precision and record. So, uh, if you use it as it is, without any pre-processing cleaning, you get around 65% with a very simple model. But when you apply to all these methodologies we discussed today, so for example, you can see all these methods, how much to, this is how much to improve. So you went from 65 to 85% with exactly the same data set. Just do some basic pre-processing and data cleaning. So in numbers, how much do we need? I mean, so the improved percentage is, for example, with a simple data clean and pre-processing, the accuracy of the same model, you jump 26%, the precision 31%, they call 60%, and F1 46%. So you can see number using a simple model just to see the effect of only data cleaning and pre-processing, how much it can improve. So even if you use, uh, even if you went to the other end and tried to increase the model complexity in order to have a very good accuracy, more or less, you will not see this peak of an improvement. You will see some improvement because some more recent model, it can handle noise, misses, and so on, but you will not never see this kind of thing. And now you can take it, as you can see, with 85%, and then you can start building more complex model more better statistical analysis in order to reach 100%. But you will never reach 100% if, if you have noise, bias, and uncertainty in your data. So that's the final stage in your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, do you have any questions? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Carol Ambrose, of the uh, very good coverage of, of many, many points in this field. Um, with regards to bias, I was uh, thinking lately, what, what are the techniques for uh, making sure that your data set uh, um, is, is not biased? Let me give you an example of what I was thinking. Say I want to um, write an... Uh, uh, an ML model to select, uh, to recruit candidates for a particular uh, field. Um, now, I know the population characteristics, right, of how many men I have, how many women, how many uh, the age ranges of the average population. Um, and, and say I, I make this uh, ML model to, to give me a pool of candidates, are there techniques where you compare uh, to assess the the biases of of such models? Where you you compare certain features, and I mean, apart from the standard, you know, uh, fifty fifty, you know, yeah, or whatever. It depends uh, what you mean by bias. For example, if you are doing questionnaires, for example, there is some techniques that you need to make sure. For example, mm -hmm. if how First of all, you have to take into consideration how important is someone to take the questionnaire. And usually there are some techniques, for example, if you if someone is in a hurry, usually they select the middle answer, for example, if you are doing questionnaire. So you need to take into consideration and not have a middle answer. So you need to force someone to, for example, read the answer and select if it's, if you are willingness just to have a negative or positive effect, it's just only to have four options, for example, mm -hmm. and then it force the, the user or the, the, the to make an active selection if the negative or positive. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of work done before you collect the data, but this is techniques we discuss after you do, for example, if you have an user, for example, that selects all the middle values, it's going to become an outlier in your data. Mm -hmm. it's going to be, so you can detect this outlier users, for example, values directly from the observation. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you mean about fairness and bias, because it's a little bit uh, what you are looking for. If it's fair or bias, for example, 
if you have a lot of sensors and one malfunction, so it, uh, of course it's not going to be either fair or accurate. So you can identify this and remove everything. But fair and accuracy <coughs> is, a, is a little bit fairness, is a little bit uh, active research, of research mm -hmm. because it's what something fair is a little bit subjective. Yeah, especially when, when uh, you know, the techniques where you uh, fill in the missing values based on uh, on the removing the outliers, you know, are there active techniques where those outliers could come from particular populations that have certain... It needs to come from the population yeah. from the rest of your subject, mm -hmm. for example, for the rest of the people that participate. So if you are trying to fill up a missing value, for example, and then it, if you take the... You want to fill up this value and then you can take the mean or median value of your target population. It can be a little bit more fair and uh, one on one, select the mean, the median, and that's the But these are active uh, decisions you have to make. You have yeah, to yes. understand your data set better first, and then you need to make this kind of decision. In general, I have I have the impression that in this field, this kind of fixing this. Fixing such things for fairness are, are are always a bit manual. There hasn't been any. Con Is there other uh, Yes or no. Yes or no. It, does, it depends on how accurate you want to be. If you, uh, it depends. The, the answer is depends. I you have to look at case by case scenario, and you have to make a, the most appropriate decision. It's not there is not a universal theory, or you have to follow this. Rules, you know, to accept fairness. Seems that most of the times the answer is it depends, <laughs> and it's true. Uh, we have a question from online. Uh, what is the best method to bin numerical values such as factors, amounts, etc.? The best method to bin numerical values. Binning. Yeah. Just Put them together into ranges. Depends on the range of your data set. I mean, binning, binning. It's uh, <laughs> I cannot give you a number. I mean, it's just uh, exactly depending depends. on the range. For example, usually if it's if, if the range of your data set is from zero to hundred and more appropriate by five, it's it's well accepted. But if it's uh, I will see it not as a number, but a percentage of your range. Usually, you if you want to see a hundred bar, you divide by the range by a hundred, and then you define the range dynamically. It's usually, this is how it's done. Any other questions? Yeah. Short one. In the case of model deployment, so you've trained your your model on a specific data set which has some characteristics and distributions, and you want and you want to apply it to another data set. What are the uh, the um, the tests that you do, and what are the transformations that you do to the new data set, or do you not do any transformations? So, for example, the first data set you've trained your model on is normally distributed, and it has these characteristics, and then you want to apply your problem to a new data set. That, and I'm just wondering, in the, you've trained the data set, now you're just deploying. Uh, are there any? Um, um, any tests, any metrics that you take? Uh, do you analyze like distribution of the new data set before or like what, what, what yes. are the kind of things in that in the data I showed, you have a number, and that's plus or minus another. So usually you, what you do is just to avoid the uh, sub-distribution of your data set. You, the numbers is not based on the training. Usually we what we do is apply in using K4 cross validation. So you this was performed by using five fold K cross validation. What you do divide the subset by uh, five different four, use the first four, for example, for training, uh, or the first three for training, the other one for validation and testing. And then you move it around. I mean, and then you do it five different times. And then you only show the results from, from the testing, the one set, the subset that you didn't see before. So that that measures what is the model perform in, in unseen data. So that's why 
And then when you do, you plot this plus minus, uh, you present the mean, plus minus the standard deviation of these five different poles. So it, it gives you a range what to expect with a new different graph. So if if you are plus or minus the deviation of these five different poles is very large, then something is wrong with your uh, how you either split the data or there is some other unseen distribution within your data that you didn't take into consideration. But it's very very close to the mean. The mean means that you have a very good overall distribution of how you split it, and then you don't have any unseen uh, even bias in your data subset and so on. So usually this is how you present it. Uh, you always present not only based on the training. You don't present the training as a fair set. You want to see how it well generalized. It's only based on the test set, the unseen data set. That's why you en how you ensure uh, how good it would perform if Something new for example. Everything is in the code. If you, or you can later on you know, how you can ensure the hard. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, next speaker is Christos Christodoulou. The stage is yours. Hello. All right. Um, I am here today to give you a more of 